Well, good morning. Good to be before you this morning. Let me ask you to do a couple of things. Uh, inside your program, you'll find your message notes that look like this. And they encourage you to take those out and use those today. Kind of follow along with us. Also, we're going to be in Mark chapter 14, if you have your Bible with you. And uh, we always will have the scripture for you on the screen. Uh, but if you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in Mark chapter 14. Last week we finished up uh, our series called Monster Heart, and this morning we begin a new series called Uncertainty, and I think that's a pretty appropriate topic for many of us right now. Uh, from time to time I will have people say to me, you know, I know you wrote that sermon for me, or I know you were thinking specifically of me when you came up with that series. Uh, for the most part, I, I don't do that. In reality, most of the inspiration for messages come from my own life. They come from my own experiences and struggles and victories in my relationship with God. But I will tell you that in the case of this series that's going to kind of lead us up until Easter, I have to admit there are a lot of situations and circumstances filled with a lot of uncertainty that are happening right now in our church in our community, uh, and in our country that will be very easy to, for us to draw from. So my goal is to help us understand how we can respond when we find ourselves at a crossroads in life with lots of uncertainty before us and very little sense of what to do or which way to go. To get us started, I want to begin with one of the most dramatic moments, certainly in the Bible, but maybe in all of human history. It took place towards the end of Jesus' ministry in an environment that we refer to as the upper room. And essentially, Jesus and his disciples were coming to Jerusalem and they were going to celebrate the Passover holiday together. And let me just mention, give you a little bit of reference for that. You may remember that Passover was a festival where the Jewish people would get together and have a meal and remember what had happened several or had happened many centuries earlier when the Israelites were in Egyptian slavery and they had their last meal together in Egypt. Now they had been in Egypt for 400 years and all that they had known at that point their their whole history as a nation was that they were slaves and they had prayed and they had prayed and they had prayed to their God God, and listen, for 400 years, their prayers went unanswered. You know, it's kind of funny if you think about it, because if, if we have, you know, four days of unanswered prayer, we're like, is there a God, right? Uh, we don't have nearly that kind of patience, but for 400 years, their prayers had gone unanswered, and so God finally sends them a deliverer, Moses. And Moses says, tomorrow we are leaving Egypt away from slavery into the promised land. But tonight, an angel of death is coming to pass over the land of Egypt. And it will kill every single firstborn from every family that, that does not have the blood of a lamb over the doorposts of their home. And so the Israelites, taking Moses at his word, they slaughtered a lamb, they had a meal, they painted the blood over their doorposts, and sure enough, that night the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt. And the next morning, the Israelites were set free. And that was the last meal, that was the last supper that the Israelites would have in Egypt. Now, 1,400 years after that event, Jesus is now going to gather his disciples to have this Passover meal together. And by the way, this wasn't the first time they had celebrated the Passover together, but this time was very different. Previous Passovers had been celebrated during times when things were going great. Because at, by this point, Jesus had become a celebrity. He was, at this point, a cultural icon. The momentum was incredible. The crowds were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The miracles were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, the, and listen, the disciples were right in the middle of it all. And they were loving it. Okay? The disciples were eating it up. But as they were about to gather for, again, what we call the Last Supper, because it was, it was the last time he would share a meal with them while he was on earth, things were not going so well at this point. Okay? The momentum had completely changed. 
You see, rumors were flying that a group of people were trying to isolate Jesus from the crowds and get him alone so that they could arrest him. And, and Christine actually referenced that verse that she read from, from Mark chapter 14. That the disciples, they did not want to hear that. They could feel something ominous in the air, I think, but they just sort of blocked it all out. Because in their way of thinking, and I think this is very much like your and I's way of thinking, if God is with you, if God is watching over you, if God is at work around you, then things are going to get fill in the blank. They're going to get better, right? They're going to get better. Because wherever God shows up, things improve. Wherever God shows up, there is more certainty, not less certainty. And yet they found themselves in a time where things weren't going well. The momentum had shifted and everything was in doubt. And that is the setting for the conversation that takes place in Mark chapter 14 in this upper room. Let me read to you Mark 14 verses 17 and 18. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. And while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now think about this for just a second. Days earlier, they entered Jerusalem, I kid you not, like rock stars. Okay? The people are waving palm branches. They are singing Hosanna to the son of David. This is a scene that we're going to celebrate about a month from now on Palm Sunday. It was a big, big crowning moment for, the, for Jesus, but I think also for the disciples. Tonight, however, they sit down to what is supposed to be a celebration meal, and Jesus just knocks the wind out of them by saying, not only will I, betray, will I be betrayed, but I'll be betrayed by one of you who is sitting here eating with me. Now, you know, yeah, we have a sense the Pharisees are mad. We have a sense the religious leaders are mad. Yeah, they want to get me by myself. Yeah, they want to arrest me and see what they can do to shut me up. But it's not one of them that it's going to come down to. It's one of you. And that little phrase, who is eating with me, it punctuated the insult. Because to eat with someone, to break bread with someone in that culture was much like eating with somebody in our culture. It would be like inviting somebody into your house, finding out and preparing their favorite meal, sitting down to a, you know, a beautiful dinner, and, and then saying to them, you know, I want to thank you so much for coming into my house. By the way, I know that you hate my guts. Okay, this is basically what happened. They're in the most intimate setting possible in that culture. And he says, not only is one of you going to betray me, but it's one of you who has chosen to gather with me around this sacred table. To celebrate, don't forget, to celebrate this amazing thing that God did centuries ago. Verse 19. They were saddened. And one by one they said to him, surely not I. It is, it, it is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. You know, it's kind of interesting that the Bible is considered to be one of the ultimate sources of comfort in the history of the world. When the reality is, this book... This Bible is full of stories, full of narratives written and taking place in the midst of extraordinary uncertainty. Have you ever thought about that? So much un unknown going on in each of these situations. In fact, I would say this, as, as we as individuals and families and as a nation are facing uncertainty like, like many of us have never faced before, you know, the, the price of oil is dangerously low, which is leaving huge question marks on our local economy. It's causing people to lose jobs on a weekly basis, even just here um, amongst our church. We're seeing this. The, the presidential election in the fall looks, looks like it's going to be one of the most contentious in recent memory. And I'm telling you, with all of the uncertainty and, and more, the Bible is the perfect place 
to turn. It's the perfect place to run because your favorite Bible story, that one that you were raised with, that one that you love to hear repeated again and again, your favorite passage of Scripture, your favorite psalm, your favorite proverb, listen to me, it was written during a time that reflected extraordinary uncertainty. Understand something. This book is not a book about rich people having fun. This isn't a book about, and then things went great. And then Monday morning, things got even better. Right? And then Tuesday, you got a job. And Wednesday, you got a raise. And Thursday, you got a bonus. And on Friday, my, all, my kids all went to medical school on a scholarship. And on Saturday, they became pre- professional athletes. Right? I mean, that, that, that's kind of that wrinkle-free life that we kind of dream of and, and fantasize about. And then they all lived happily ever after. I need you to understand something. It's not in there. Instead, every single narrative, every single passage, everything that we draw hope from came from times of trouble, trouble, trouble from the lives of people who discovered this truth. And I want to ask you to to begin by writing this down. In the midst of uncertainty, God is still certain. Amen. I I feel like we ought to call, I'm not going to do this, but I feel like we ought to call Jamie up here and make her write a song on the spot right now. (laughs) Jamie, come on, you can come up with a song from that principle, can you not? In the midst of uncertainty... God is still certain. When there is no evidence of God's hand at work, when it seems like He's totally absent, you know, to the tenth power, the people in this story discovered that He is still trustworthy. And I'm telling you, if ever there was a time to pick this up and to read it, it's now. This past fall, we did a church-wide emphasis called The Story which was an 18-week study of a condensed version of the entire Bible. And it was such a good opportunity for us to to get a big-picture perspective of the Bible. But I think we also got some sense of this principle that I'm talking about. And let me give you some examples. The story of Joseph, one of my favorite stories. I've always turned to Joseph because I feel like I learn something new every time I read it. Joseph was a teenager in the Old Testament who finds himself at the bottom of a well. Do you remember the story? And above him, he hears his brothers having this conversation. Should we sell him or should we kill him? I don't know. Let's sell him. No, let's kill him. Now listen, I realize you have sibling rivalry in your house, okay? You know, over she borrowed my blouse and then she threw it back on the bed and it's still wrinkled. And I I realize that, you know, it's not fair and he touched me and, and, you know, can you please make him stop touching me and all of that. I get all of that, okay? But Joseph is in the bottom of a well listening to his brothers discuss, do we sell him or do we kill him? And yet you read the story and you discover that, believe it or not, God was actually with Joseph in an incredible way. We read the story about King David, who eventually the Messiah would come from his lineage. But he's awakened one day. And again, I know that, you know, parents, you have problems with your kids. But he wakes up one day to discover that his son has raised an army and is about to invade the capital city and conquer him and replace him as king. (laughs) But again, you read that story and you discover that as bad as it got, God was still with David. He was with David all along. And then there was the story that most of us heard growing up about a mother who had a baby. And like any mother, she loved her son deeply, but she was told that Pharaoh had decided to murder all of the baby boys because there were too many Israelites in Egypt. And I realize there's so much emotion around babies, so much emotion around children, so many prayers are prayed for sick children. And and here's a mother who wraps up her newborn son, think about it, puts him in a basket and shoves him into the Nile River. As if to say, if if it's down to uh, crocodiles and Egyptian butchers, I'll take my chance with the river. And yet you read the story and you discover God was there 
That little baby was found and they named him Moses and he became the deliverer of Israel that I was telling you about earlier. And that was all a, a foreshadowing of another baby that would be rescued from a similar fate as Mary and Joseph discovered that King Herod had heard a rumor that there was a baby being born that would grow up to be the Jewish king. And so in jealousy and in hate, he decided that instead of trying to find the baby, he would just wipe out an entire generation of Jewish babies. And so he sent his butchers into Bethlehem and the surrounding areas, the Bible says, to murder every single baby boy. But Joseph and Mary escaped to... Anybody know where they escaped to of all places? Back to Egypt. Back to Egypt to save the baby Jesus. And even as there was weeping and wailing in the land, you read the story and you discover that God was right there in the middle of everything. That God somehow still had the whole world in His hands. That in every single story where it seems that everything had spun completely out of control and all of the momentum is backwards momentum, and all of God's activity has ceased and the bad guys had won and the evil king won and the gods of the pagan empires won. You read the stories and you discover in the midst of that extraordinary uncertainty, there's God. And nothing had changed. Let me read the rest of this, verse 22. While they were eating, and, and I'm telling you, this sucked the breath right out of these guys, okay? Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, oh yeah, by the way, this isn't what you think it is, okay? You've been eating Passover meals since you were children, but from now on, when you eat it, you need to think of it this way. He said, take, take it, this is my body. This is my body that will be broken for you. Now what, what do you mean this is your body? Can, can you hear the disciples? Can you hear them saying, here we go with all this death talk again. All this negativity. We don't want to hear this. Because honestly, Jesus, if you're from God, then things have to turn around, right? If you're from God, things have to go well for us. If you're from God, there has to be more certainty, not less certainty. Isn't that what we were all taught? Growing up all of our lives, verse 23, then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and, he, and they all drank from it. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And he foreshadows what's going to take place hours later when he's going to be nailed to a cross and die in front of their very eyes. But then the news gets worse. Verse 27. He says, not only this, but you will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, I don't know, you know, I don't know how much you know about the disciples. I, if you know anything about them, you may have a disciple that you kind of relate to. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like every time he talks, you're like, oh yeah, that's me. That's, that's what I would have said. That's what I would do. I think many of us relate to Peter, yes, because Peter kind of had foot and mouth disease all the time, right? He was always saying things he probably shouldn't have said. He was just so passionate. I mean, I, no one doubts he loved God, but he had a tendency to tell God how to do things. Not that any of you would know anything about that, right? But at this point, Peter is sitting there and he's listening. And, and you've been there. He finally has just had enough. He's had enough. And, and he says, okay, that is it. Enough of this. Enough negative. Enough bad news. Enough about death. Uh, enough arrest. Enough about betrayal. There is no way we are going to allow this to happen. Because if God is with you and you're the Son of God, this is not how the story goes. Have you ever said that to God? I have. 
This is not how the story goes, God. This is not what my life is supposed to look like. This is not the outcome that I dreamed of. This is not how the story goes. There's supposed to be more certainty, more faith, more miracles, more activity, more intervention. And so in verse 29, Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. Because that is not how the story is supposed to go. Even if everybody else abandons you, I am not going to fall away. I will stick with you to the very end. And yet hours later, Peter would find himself denying not once, not twice, but three times, even knowing, much less following, Jesus. Now here's my question for you and for me. As we move into this series over the next few weeks, and as we continue to experience probably extraordinary uncertainty in our families, in our jobs, with our children, in our culture. Uncertainty with our leadership, with our Congress, with our Senate with our president, with our economy, with our retirement, with earthquakes. I mean, God, did we need one more natural disaster in Oklahoma? Really? With everything that's happening in our world, all that uncertainty, here's the question. Can you still trust God when there is absolutely no evidence of His activity in the world around you? That's the question. Can you continue to embrace faith in God as a loving Heavenly Father in moments where there's absolutely, at least in your mind, to your eyes, no evidence of His activity in your life, in our culture, in our country, seemingly at times in our world? And, and listen to me. Your answer to that question will determine your response to the continuing uncertainty we face in the future. Your answer to that question will determine our response to the uncertainty in our lives, with our children, with our families. And here's the strange thing. Here's the dilemma, especially for Americans that equate God with prosperity... And by the way, why shouldn't we? We have been so incredibly prosperous. Yes or no? For Americans who equate God with forward motion, and why shouldn't we? Most of us have experienced primarily forward motion in our lives, have we not? Americans who equate God's presence with physical, tangible blessing, and why shouldn't we? That's been the experience for most of us for generations but I imagine if you were to go to the disciples, these men gathered at this table, if you were to go to them months later, I, as Christine and I went to a movie yesterday afternoon, we went and saw a, a new movie out called Risen. And you may have seen it advertised. It's not been widely advertised, but um, it's a movie from the point of view of a Roman soldier who oversaw the death and crucifixion of Jesus and then was responsible to determine what actually happened to him. Where did the body go whenever it disappeared? And one of the most interesting parts of this movie, and by the way, I can, I can absolutely recommend it to you, one of the interesting parts of this movie had to do with the disciples. This Roman soldier, now this is all, you understand this is fiction, but this soldier intersects with the disciples at one point as they are waiting for Jesus to come back. And the desperation that they experience is kind of hard to watch. And then he, he comes back and they're with him for a moment. And then he's gone. If you remember this part of the Bible, he's gone. And then he's back. And he teaches them and he's with them. And then he's gone. And the last time he tells them, one last time I'm going to spend time with you beside the Sea of Galilee. I, I hate to give the movie away. <laughs> <laughs> 
One last time, he spends the evening, he eats a meal, he talks to them, he teaches them, and when they wake up in the morning, he's not there. And the disciples wake up and they look around and he's gone. And you just can see the desperation wash over them. And they one by one, especially Peter, begin to call out, Yeshua! 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 Hoping that he'll come back. I think that if you had asked those men, why, when was the darkest moment for you when you followed Jesus? I know there had to be some highs, but there had to be lows. When was the darkest moment? When was the moment where you had the least amount of hope? Where was the point when you began to wonder, maybe we've made a mistake in following Him? Maybe He is just another false Messiah. Maybe we've wasted our lives. When was the darkest moment? And I believe that they would have said to you, it began when we gathered around the dinner table and realized things were not going to get better. It's when we gathered around the table that night and He promised us that not only would, would one of us betray Him, but all of us would fall away. And within hours, all of us had. And the one man who swore he'd never fall away had denied Him three times. Then, hours later, we saw Jesus arrested. We saw Him tried. And we saw Him die. You want to know when the darkest hours were for us? It was those hours when we realized we have completely wasted our time. And God is not up to anything here. And, and, and then, if, if we said, okay... See, I have a lot of imaginary conversations in my mind. I don't know if you guys do this or not, but I'm really good at this. If we said to them, all right, then when in your time with Jesus would you say God was doing his greatest work? Was it healing the, that guy that was born blind? Remember Jesus spits in the, in the dirt and he rubs mud in his eyes and tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. I love that story. And the guy comes back seeing. Do you remember that? That's where we get the song Amazing Grace from. Because the Pharisees asked the man who had been born blind, you know, what happened? Who did this? Was it wizardry? Was it, you know, is he a demon? What? And the guy says, do you remember this? He says, I, I have no idea. Here's what I know. I once was blind, say it, but now, <laughs> come on, that's an awesome story, all right? Was that it? Disciples, was that the moment? That, that was pretty amazing, right? Or, or, or how about standing outside the tomb of Lazarus? When Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, and he'd literally been in there four stinking days, and he comes out of that tomb alive. Was that the time? Was that it? When, when you saw that God's presence was most with you? I mean, looking back, when was God doing the most? And, and you know what I believe they would have said? I believe they would have said it was those same hours. <laughs> when it seemed to us at the time that God was doing the least. It was those same hours when it seemed like he was absent, when he was missing. And yet, in those darkest, darkest hours when it seemed that he was completely inactive, he was the most active ever. Because those darkest hours were the epicenter of the salvation of mankind. Think about it. These would be the hours that for literally thousands of years people all over the world would look back to and rejoice at God's goodness and grace. We would sing songs about them. But if you'd asked us in that moment, we would have said, game over. Waste of time. Not a man of God. We've wasted our lives. Do you see it? Do you see it? See, here's the truth. 
It is often in times when God seems the least active that He is doing the greatest work. Okay? Listen. That is a difficult message for us. That is a difficult message for American Christians. And yet it is our story for those of us who have chosen to follow God and specifically for those of us who have decided to place our faith in Jesus as Savior. That God seems to take broken things and do His most amazing work. That God seems to wait until the last minute sometimes to do His most amazing work. That God seems to take busted up and hopeless situations and show up in ways different from what we would choose. Because we would never allow things to get as bad as oftentimes they get. But this is God's way. The greatest things begin in the biggest messes. I'll tell you something else. The most amazing works of God generally are launched in times of personal or national brokenness. This is what God does. This is how He works. And it's not like it's some kind of surprise. He has consistently done this over and over again throughout the Bible, throughout the history of mankind. But the question for you and the question for me is, will we maintain faith when we cannot see His hand? And as our faith begins to stutter and maybe shake a little bit, and as we begin to look at our circumstances and struggle with some doubts, I'm telling you now, more than ever, God's Word is the place to go. Because all of these stories and all of these words and even our salvation was birthed at a time of extraordinary darkness and extraordinary uncertainty. Now, you may say, well, Justin, that is, that is neat. And even maybe a little bit inspirational. But that is not going to help me through this next round of layoffs. Right? That is, uh, that is not going to get my kids through school. That is not going to change anything tomorrow when my wife gets back to work and finds out whether or not she's going to be able to keep her job. And that's not going to get me a commission. And that's not going to change anything about my prodigal son or daughter. And quite honestly, that doesn't make me well in my body. And you know what? You're right. But here's where I am. This is our message. Although that idea, that insight, that truth about Scripture doesn't change anything about our circumstances, here's what it does. It allows you to embrace uncertainty with the certainty of knowing that God is still in control. That although life is uncertain, God is not. Will you say that with me? Although life is uncertain, God is not. That although my family is uncertain, and nature is uncertain, and the economy is uncertain, and the world seems to be uncertain, God is not uncertain. And embracing this knowledge, even if it's with our fingernails just barely hanging on, Is that not the cutest thing you've ever seen? Huh? It it keeps us... Listen, listen, listen. You better take the cat away. They're not going to listen to what I'm saying. Thank you. Embracing, Embracing this knowledge keeps us from making decisions that would even further complicate the difficulties that we're facing. It allows you to discover, as we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks, that there is a way to have peace even in the midst of the storm. It will teach us to keep an eye out for the activity of God that that may take us by surprise, as it often took the characters in Scripture by surprise. So hang on to, and I'm, I'm, I'm begging you, embrace this simple truth. 
Although life is uncertain, God is not. And regardless of what we see or don't see, we have the opportunity to embrace a faithful, faithful God, even those circumstances where it is very difficult, maybe impossible to see His hand or to catch a glimpse of His face. Because God is still in control. Hear me. God is still on His throne. God is still a God that we can worship with abandon and God is a God that we can continue to trust. You know why? Because in the midst of incredible uncertainty, God is still certain and He still holds the whole world. He still has your world in His hands. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, for some of us, <clears throat> right now, this is a lifeline. It's our only lifeline. We, we feel like we're hanging on by our fingernails. For others of us, it's next week we're going to need this. We don't even know it yet. Next month, we're going to need this. This summer, that we're going to need to know this. And we don't even recognize it yet. Because only you know the future. And God, I pray that in the uncertainty to come, that we would be the people that would cling to and hold on to, not our ability to interpret circumstances, not our tendency to judge you based on what you do or don't do, but that we would be the men and the women of a faithful God in spite of what we see and experience. Father, we confess together today that we believe that you work in all things, that, that you work through all things, that you show yourself strong in all things, that you are in control of all things. That you are the God of certainty even when life is uncertain. So God, I pray as we prepare to leave this place this morning, give us wisdom to know how to, to understand and accept that and express that. How to talk about it with our family. How to talk about it at work or at school. That we might not only be encouraged ourselves, but that we might be able to encourage others who are going through great uncertainty in their life. Thank you, God. That you are a God who works through broken things in difficult times to do your greatest work. I love you and I thank you for the certainty you bring to my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.